in this group, you are joined today by a well, familiar voice, but no familiar hosting voice. It's Harry. Um, yeah, welcome back to Down the Slope. We've not got a full house today, unfortunately. Ewan can't join us today. But Greg, um, to try and spice things up a bit, what's your favourite ever memory of Hibs in January? Anthony Stokes setting off the fire alarm and uh, warm weather training in January. Um, <laughs> and subsequently getting sacked from the club. That was a good laugh. Yeah, that, that was that was something. How are you? How are you doing? I'm very well, mate. Thank you. How are you? I know, mate. I'm specky, so I'm all right. Uh, Liam, coming to you next. Uh, Favourite memory of Hibs in January? Oh, I'm, I'm really struggling with this one. Uh, I'm going to say uh, Hibs beating Bonnie Rogros 8-1 in the Scottish Cup. I'm pretty sure that was in January. It's a game that it kind of goes under the radar and it's forgotten about, but uh, scoring eight goals at Pine Castle is quite special. Uh, the, the one thing I seem to remember, and I can't remember precisely who, but was it no? We scored eight goals and there was like six or seven different goal scorers as well. It's pretty rare that that happens. But anyway, yeah. aye, it was good, good, good day in the Scottish Cup, eight one. And I believe that was our first, uh, first game after our defence of having won, won the trophy, uh, just a matter of months previous. So, aye, yeah. sweet memories. I was going to say because I remember ironically chanting "Here we go, two in a row" after we'd scored against Bonnie Rig, and then um, <laughs> after we'd scored like the fourth goal, the entire crowd started singing it. So I was like, "I'm not the only ironic one here." One, um, one of the goal scorers has come back to me. Chris Humphrey scored. Do you remember Chris Humphrey? Yeah, debut debut yeah, against United, player. and I was like, "He's he's going to be brilliant. He's going to be brilliant." Well, unfortunately, I think injuries have kind of taken its toll, yeah. taken their toll on him. But that debut against Dundee United, he, he, everyone was set up for him to be a really good Hibs player. It didn't happen. Shame. Anyway. A bit, a bit of a bottle merchant, eh? Because he had all the makings for a good hips player, like just a bit of a pacey wing, a bit different from what we've normally got. But um, we're talking from goal fest against Bonnie and Groves to an absolute boar fest through in Fur Park. We went to Motherwell and we drew nil nil, and it was yet another terrible game, I think it's fair to say. But before the game started, Greg, what did you make of the start in 11? Were you happy? Do you think you only went for eight players with who was available? Um, I was happy to Miller playing. Um... I wasn't happy to Josh Campbell playing, um, and I think that was justified throughout the game. Um, he was miles off it, to be fair. Um, other than that, other than Macy um, and McGinn, I, I was okay with the team. Yeah, and Liam, touching on that, um, you were the only one in the chat last night that kind of defended Campbell just because you had an engine on him as opposed to Henderson, who's just kind of that creative player. Um, do you think there was a solid logic behind playing Campbell, or do you think that Henderson really should have been starting? Uh, I think Henderson's still got a wee bit to go till he's kind of up to up to full match speed and match fitness. I think that was evident against Cove for for, for spells of the game. So Campbell's been playing regularly. Um, I can understand what and stick with kind of consistency of selection, being a new manager and and you know, knowing the players that, the way he knows them. Um, I think the only thing I would say with Josh Campbell is, and, and we talked about this, is his better games have been in games where we've had less of the ball. And uh, Motherwell last night, we happened to have quite a lot of possession, as you probably would expect against that Motherwell team. So I think there's definitely an argument for taking the likes of Campbell out of the team in those games when we're going to have more possession. Um, because simply when we've got the ball, we need quality to make things happen. And I'm not sure necessarily he's got that kind of composure in the final third to do that for us. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and Liam, still sticking with you, something that we've been scrutinised for um, this season has been our defending. Um, it's just we seem to be leaking goals everywhere. But uh, Maloney, um, first uh, three games in charge, sorry, first five games in charge, we kept three clean sheets. Has he found the right balance or is it just a bit too laboured and boring at the moment? Um, I, 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 I think laboured and boring is maybe a, a, a tad harsh. Um, I think I think there is definitely an element of us keeping the ball for longer spells and the opposition can't really hurt you if you <laughs> you keep possession for 60-65% of the game. You're, they're less likely to be able to hurt you, certainly. So there, there's an element of that coming into it. Um, I think he's obviously quite keen on the three centre-halves, which... Um, I've never, I've not done the statistical analysis on it, but my, my, my memory and my mind tells me we maybe, maybe do tend to concede fewer goals when we've got three centre halves in the team. We certainly concede fewer goals from crosses when we've got three centre halves in the team. So maybe, maybe, maybe he stumbled upon the right uh, thing. But I think one thing I would just say just on the defence really quickly is I think it's difficult because he's not really been able to select a consistent back three or back five because of injuries and suspensions and what have you players coming in and out and um, so kind of feel for him a little bit in that respect as well and Greg as our commanding centre back do you think as a testament to Maloney the fact that the defence has changed virtually every game just due to selection issues do you think that's a testament to him we've actually managed to keep clean sheets 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's just the, the, the defenders are doing their jobs. Um, we've seen it before plenty uh, this season already that, that when, when we don't defend properly, um, we look shaky, everyone looks nervy, we can see silly goals. Um, so it's good to see that we've kept clean, three clean shoots already under Maloney. I think I was certainly impressed with Bushiri last night. Um, very aggressive, um, which I like to see. So I think... I think at the moment our problem isn't at the back so much. I think it's it's going forward. Um, the, the final third passes were like seventy two last night, um, even though we had sixty two and a half percent possession. So for me, that that's the worry. Um, defending obviously is important, but we seem to have sorted that out. We bit patchwork, um, but certainly the issue going forward is a bigger one for me at the moment. Yeah, no, I absolutely would have to agree with that. It's a bit bizarre how polarising it is to the start of the season where we seem to be able to score goals for fun for the first eight to 12 games. And then now it seems like we couldn't score if we had three 90 minutes consecutively. Um, first half, there wasn't really too much. A minute in, this bit got um, in behind the defence. I was hoping that was going to be a sign of things to come. Didn't really happen. I was impressed with Josh Doig. I thought that Josh Doig in both halves seemed to be making quite a few runs. For me personally, he looks a bit more like he was last season. He seems to be quite more confident on the ball and actually willing to take players on. Was there any players in particular that impressed either of you? Probably Daig. For, for, for me, uh, again, I think Rocky Bashiri had a, a particularly good game. Maybe one or two moments just that of, of sort of minor, uh, <laughs> minor concern early on. But I thought he had a really good game, his aggression. And, and Greg and I were exchanging messages on it last night, how good it was to see without Porteous and the team yeah. that there was another centre-half that was willing to go and meet the ball and go and contest things a wee bit higher up the park. Gives you a bit more of a platform to play from as well if your centre-half's willing to do that. So those two stood out for me. I thought Cadden was quite good again as well, actually. Um, uh, maybe not so much in the final third, but again, just being that outlet and being prepared to prepare to take the run. That, those were the standouts for me, I think. Thank you, yourself. I would absolutely agree with that. I think that Doig looked good. Um, I think, I think we can all probably agree that defending's not a strong point when he's following up the pitch. He has a better option for us. Um, I thought Cadden as well, to be fair. I thought I, thought, I actually thought Villa had a no bad game. Um, maybe not as influential as he was against Cove, but I thought certainly for his first um, slice of the action in, in the league, I thought, I thought he, was, he was pretty good. Um, it's just a shame that the midfield seemed to be seemed to be lacking massively. We're, we're so one dimensional in there. Um, I think Newell played a pass forward for Nisbet straight away, and I was hoping that was going to be a sign of things to come. But I feel like I feel like we're we're, we're just taking an easy option now. Um, I feel like in Maloney's first game, we we're maybe being a wee bit more adventurous. Um, but now I feel like maybe going back to our old habits and, and just knocking the ball about instead of actually knocking that ball through with purpose. But yeah, there's still plenty to work. I'm not going to start fucking slating, slating the manager <laughs> because, you know, you have a chance, but yeah. We'll no, Greg, let's get it right. You're not going to start slating the manager yet. That's not pretty work. You know, let's get it right. You know, we've not we've not had a shot on target in three games. You know, that's not that's not good enough. Um, however, league games. Yeah, league games. Um, <laughs> however, you know, you Rome wasn't built in a day and the boys come in, he done well against we were done well against Dundee United, we're all feeling positive, but you know, we've we've had a break. We bit disruption with new boys coming in. Um so I, I'm I'm honestly not concerned. I think that people need to stop wet in the bed, to be quite honest. I think some of the comments I've seen last night were wildly over the top. Um I mean uh, people saying that oh well Jack Ross wasn't as bad as this but let's be honest it was a much bigger sample size um, <laughs> but yeah I think that like, Maloney is not stupid I think he, he's trying to be positive because he, that's the kind of guy he is he's not going to just come out and and say that, oh we were shite you were shite that was shite you know he's going to come out and he's going to try and be positive he, at the end of the day he's got to work with these players day in day out you know people can sit on Twitter and tweet about the players but they'll never actually meet them in life, real life so well, he's got a working relationship, needs to be professional. I think he has been professional. I think people wet the bed over his comments, so they need to grow up. I'm interested, uh, I'm interested in your take, Harry, on this because I think one thing that, that's quite clear for me so far with Maloney is we seem to be quite wedded to that 3 4 3 system, which 
kind of leaves you a wee bit maybe with one striker who's potentially a little bit isolated in Kevin Nisbet and I know you've been a massive champion of two up front particularly when it's Dodge and Nisbet do you think Muller can play as a central striker in a 3-5-2 or do you think we need Dodge and Nisbet or one of the others in a striker? The thing I really like about Muller is the fact that he picks the ball up all over the pitch and there was one point where he picked the ball up from Doig and Doig made a run down the wing and Muller was at like left wing back position and played the ball through to him but obviously if he's supposed to be up front with his bit then it leaves one person in the box for free Motherwell defenders to defend so I, th- I think there is a bit of balance that's missing especially going forward I think that's really transparent um, yeah, I think Muller's a player that's kind of floats around. I, I don't think that he's suited to be a striker in this system. Um, I think that Nisbet also likes to drop quite often. So having two strikers that do similar things for me, it's just not a system that's going to work. But I just think with... I, I don't think uh, Maloney fancies Deutsch at all, which is a bit concerning for me. So it doesn't really mean we've got that fallback option um, that we kind of had under Jack Ross, where he could occasionally switch it up and play a bit more direct. Um but yeah, no, it's it's interesting. Are, are you guys liking the three four three? As I say, I think it gives us we seem to be a lot more stable defensively. We're not really leaking many chances. Um, but going forward, it is frustrating to see them go side to side. It doesn't really seem to have that much progression. I, I'm not sure about the three four three as a as a system. I think it generally in some games it will work because it what it allows you to do is it widens the pitch out and allows you to find space in areas where the three five two might not because you can create a an overload with kind of having the, the wing back and then potentially one of the wide midfielders kind of coming over to one side, create a bit of space. But I, I, I worry that we're, 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 we're kind of maybe sticking to it a wee bit too rigidly. So in the likes of the game last night, when there's kind of 12 minutes to go, you've got an opportunity when they've got they've gone down to 10 men, opportune time to go, you know, gung-ho and throw everything at it. And I'm just seeing a wee bit of like, Maybe nervousness or reservation about doing that, which which when you say it worries me, but I just I just think we need to be be more adaptable than we've been so far, maybe. Yeah, and Greg, your opinion on three four three? To be honest, I, I like it. To be fair, um, I've always been a champion for for three at the back. To be fair, I think that of course at times I think some of the subs are a bit questionable. Um, but Maloney sees these players day in, day out. So I would like to see a switch up a bit more, maybe a wee bit more adventurous um, rather than just sticking to the 3 4 3. But to be honest, he, he's a young manager. He's going to make mistakes. You know, that's why Gary Caldwell's a wee bit of experience. So yeah, I think, I think we can all just calm the head. We'll go again on, on Saturday and, and next week, and so we'll see where we are after that. But yeah, I think. I don't mind it, to be fair. He's the manager. I trust him more than I trust Jack Mills, to be fair. So if he wants to bring on Dre Wright, then bash on some. And just before we come on to this, absolutely one last thing I'll say on 3 4 3. I think it's quite a good counter attacking system just because you can kind of throw players forward quickly whilst not having to worry too much because you've got the three centre backs staying back. But I just feel if you're keeping possession the whole time, there's not really that opportunity to quickly get the ball forward and you don't really see as many runs in behind. But it's definitely something that they'll be working on, obviously. And I think that Maloney's going to be an absolute articulate little, um, or sorry, meticulous little um, demon when it comes to tactics. So I'm sure he'll iron something out. But yeah, um, Liam, Greg mentioned it there, but talk to me about the subs. Um, I was quite, uh, I came down quite hard on Maloney for the subs he's made the last two games, and I wasn't particularly impressed with what he'd done um, during the Motherwell game as well. What did you make of the subs? Um... Uh, I, I mean, it's difficult. It's really difficult to, to say a huge amount about them that <laughs> that, 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 that was overly positive. I'm going to try and be as balanced about them as I possibly can. I was a bit frustrated by the the Dre Wright on for Chris Mueller substitution because, and it's not it's not it's not nothing against Dre Wright because I think recently, you know, and and it, we said everyone got a clean slate of slate under Maloney and, and Dre Wright was included in that, and I think he's been fine when he's come in and and and, and played on the Maloney. But I just felt with with Mueller maybe. Based on what we'd seen against Cove and, and and certainly the early stages of that that Motherwell game, I felt like he probably provided more of a goal threat in the final third, and that's ultimately the <laughs> what we were trying to get at that stage of the game. Um, Dimitri Mitchell for Josh Campbell, no no issues with that substitution whatsoever. Mm. I thought that was a decent sub. I thought Mitchell did well when he came on, um, and 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 not Henderson on for for Stevenson also a pretty you know pr- pretty decent sub in my eyes to be honest. Um, I think I think. Um, you know, 
you know, obviously those two happened at the same time and that kind of allowed us to sort of reshuffle a wee bit. I didn't mind Josh Doyle going in at left centre back when we're chasing the game. I'm quite, I'm all right with that because it gives you kind of an attacking outlet in that kind of position. Um, and then Doyle John from Newell. I mean, you've touched on already, Harry. I'm, I, I, again, I don't think it's a terrible substitution, but we just like to have seen Doyle a wee bit earlier, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, speak, speaking of Deutsch, Greg, I, I was I was quite vocal in the chat yesterday. Um, I think any striker worth their salt needs to at least stick that on target. The chance that broke him at the end is that is that me being a bit harsh, or do you think that he really needs to do better with that opportunity? I, I, I don't think you've been harsh at all. I think he has got to, to get on target at the very least. Um, Henderson's played a, a wonderful ball. Um, it's been held up in the wind. It was followed to Deutsch perfectly, and I, I, he's just. Smart, uh, snapped at it so I think you have more composure and he works the keeper there at the very least but yeah I think that I, I just I look at the subs last night and you know you think why, why is Dodge coming on with eight minutes to go you know we're needing, we're needing a goal we've had no shots on target um, uh, my preference would have been to bring him on, on sooner but I, I guess that Maloney's had things that he's looking to work through um, so we'll, we'll wait and see but I think I think Ewan Henderson done a lot more in the two minutes two minutes he was on the park than, than what Josh Campbell done in 75 so yeah I, um, I just think that Josh Campbell um, is not, not a first 11 player um, I think he actually almost slows us down a wee bit he, he has no real ability going forward I feel like he's just purely an engine so this isn't bashing him this is just my opinion on it so yeah I think that I think for me Ewan Henderson is a much better option but I'm sure there are people that will be disagreeing with that Yep I, I find it very difficult to disagree with myself to disagree with that myself um, I feel that there was a time from this season where we kind of needed them it was something a bit fresh over that period that we were really struggling where we just kind of needed that energy but now with the bodies we've brought in I am finding it frustrating that he's still that he seems to be one of the first names on the team sheet under Maloney. Yeah. I'm hoping that as time progresses, that will stop. As we say, not a slate on the boy himself, but he just doesn't seem to be cutting it at this level as we would have liked him to. Um, but yeah, only other key talking point, well, two key talking points of the game I can think of. The red card, I think, is a second yellow. Pretty, a pretty straightforward decision for the ref. Well, I mean, the ref was inconsistent all night. And, yeah. You know, I mean, Van Veen's smashed Bashiri in, in the boards a couple of times. Um, no booking. And then Alexander's more about the second yellow, which for me is, could, could easily be a red. You know, he, he's nowhere near in control. So for me, I think it's it's probably bored on a straight red. He's probably second yellow, he's off, but he's just reckless. Um, I don't, I don't think Alexander can have any complaints about his red card either. The absolute mouthpiece and yeah, just a sad man, really. Don't know, don't know who's trying to impress with his dress sense, but screams Jack Ross to me. <laughs> <laughs> My and Liam, I want, I want you to talk about there was, there was one downside to the defence, and it's something that's kind of haunted our dreams and nightmares since the season started and since last season as well. Um, corners. They had an absolute sitter, felt the one player in their team you wouldn't want it to fall to, but Van Veen managed to miss it, sliced it, went wide. He was at the back post and he had a wide open goal to smack it in. How bad was that defending? And were we end up lucky getting away with a point after how bad that defending was? Oh, it was proper heart and mouth stuff. Eh? <laughs> no, it's no. like it's it's one of those ones if you're at the game that you do the audible gasp around you. Eh? Like <laughs> I wasn't there last night, sadly, so I, I wasn't there to do that. <gasps> Like the intake of breath, Aye, that would have that would have been a sore one. Having nightmares about Kevin Van Veen for like months to come after that. Um, he is, he's a, yeah, I mean, not to talk too much about him as a loyal player, but he has a bloody handful, isn't he? Like he he he, he really enjoys. I know I thought Rocky did a really good job on him last night, but he really enjoys that side of the game, doesn't he? Like likes ruffling folk up and chucking about, chucking folk about. It's a bit of a throwback, like an old school centre forward that just wants to be like a bit of a battering ram. Uh, Quite enjoy guys like that, like still being around in the game and still being able to have a career despite being because he is like relatively limited as a, a footballer. But he's I could watch. <clears throat> I guess he would he would probably admit that he was quite limited, and that's probably why he was a bit more physical. But yeah, he should definitely be sticking that chance away, and they got away with one there. Yeah, 
know, he's absolutely a mother wolf striker. There's probably another couple that we could name across the years, like Sutton springs to mind. He's just a big physical guy. He doesn't really do much with the ball at his feet, but he can just kind of throw everybody else around. Um, Higdon. Oh, God, oh, Michael Higdon. What that, like, I, I used, often use the word huddy. That used to be a phrase that was used often uh, as I was growing up to describe football players, and he was an absolute huddy, uh, that lad. But yeah, in terms of the mobile game, unfortunately, I don't think there's really too much else to talk about. It was pretty bland. It was quite physical. The weather, I'm not going to give the boys an excuse. Uh, the weather was bad, but it would still be playing better than that. Um, but yeah, thinking of the future, um, where do we go from here? Do we think that competing for Hearts for third place is viable at the rate that we're playing at the moment? Or do we need another couple of signs to inject some life into the team? Um, what's the realistic end of the season after Maloney's first five games? Top six for me, like I don't, I don't know if we'll get any further than that. Um, we had to win last night to, to stand any chance. So I think we should be realistic. Um, I'm going to say this now at quarter to nine on the 27th of January and say that top six uh, would be okay because um, I can't see us now catching anyone else. All right, Liam, don't talk to me. We're going to be hearing Champions League music at Easter Road next season. Please tell me that's how positive you are. <laughs> uh, I, th- I, think, I, think, I think fourth is wholly realistic. And and fourth, I, if I'm not mistaken, does does get you a European place this season, irrespective of the outcome of other competitions. So I think, um, I think fourth is realistic. Having said that... Uh, to finish fourth, we will need to improve because there's there's a lot of games at the moment and um, there's a lot of points up for stake over the next few weeks. Third is not entirely out of the question, but it is very, very unlikely where we're at in the season right now. Um, and given our tendency not to pick up points in, ga- in games like the one last night. So I, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm going out and by saying I think we'll be Probably fourth best case scenario, worst case scenario, fifth or sixth. I, 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 the, the, the teams below us who could who could push up are probably Aberdeen. Um, I think St Mirren could kick on. I know I've been saying that since the beginning of the season, but I really do think St Mirren could kick on. Um, I see Dundee United slipping away. Uh, I know they got a result last night, but I do see them slipping away. So who's? I mean, I don't. Aberdeen's probably the only one who's really going to push us. To be honest, for fourth. And look what happened last season when it came down to the crunch. We had we had too much for them, so I think we'll be fourth. I'm still going in for third because I hate the Hearts. I'm never going to admit that they're better than us. They're less than ten points away, so you never. To be fair, by the time we beat them, if they lose at the weekend, we win at the weekend. Potentially only th- three points behind them by this time next week. We definitely take that, and that's a completely different ball game. But that is what will feel like a lifetime away. Um, so I just want to quickly touch on Maloney. Obviously, relatively small sample size. I think pre-Christmas, the two games he was in charge, we, I personally thought we looked very good in both of them. The three since haven't been quite as convincing. If you just had to give Maloney a quick rating out of 10, because we love numbers on this podcast, what are you rating him out of 10, Greg? I'd probably give him a six, to be fair. He's had the new manager effect when he's come in. We have slipped off kind of the last couple of games also. That would probably say a six. Any, any higher than six if we're considering signings as well? I've always got to go fucking higher than Greg, haven't I? It's more fucking positive than Greg. Greg's the baseline. Like I've got to be at least a couple of points above that. Uh, I'll be. I'll, I'll. I'll give him a seven. I'll give him a seven. I think um, recency bias could allow me to to maybe score him a wee bit lower than that. But I, I think if you think about the Aberdeen game, good performance, Dundee United on Boxing Day. Probably one of our performances of the season, the way we played against Dundee United. We got through a tricky tie, tricky tie against Cove. I know it was hard going. I think the, 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 down, the down bits of the, the, the Celtic game and, and, and last night, to be honest, are probably the two bits that kind of count against them. But I'll give him a seven because I, I think the thing we've got to remember with Maloney, and I've said it already about the defence, but he's not had his problems to seek early on. Yeah, He's not had Porches to play. Um, you know, what do you think of Paul McGinn? He's been a regular season. He's not been able to play. He's had guys coming in who've picked up injuries. The Harry Clark one, for example. I mean, that's a that's a, that that's just really unfortunate. Melkerson not getting the work permit, then not being fit. He's not having McGinnis to select from. He's not had problems to seek. He's he's he, for me, he's doing a grand job at the moment. Yeah, and by this time next week after we've pumped only 3-0 and hard 6-0, we'll all be giving him 13 at a time. 
So I'd, I'd probably, I'd probably, st- I'll, I'll be the happy clapper. I'll give him a seven and a half. Um, I'll say that he's done a good job so far. Uh, he's convinced me already, so I'm going to stay on the Maloney train as far as it can take me. But yeah, moving on, um, we'll move on to transfers. Uh, we have got one new body, um, essentially, and Liam, I'll let you take it away. We don't really know anything about the laddie, but Liam can pronounce his name better than me. <laughs> that is the extent of my qualification to talk about him, is the fact that I can pronounce a Norwegian five-letter name. Uh, uh, well, it doesn't take much to be a football expert these days, does it? You just got to start your own podcast and just uh, just pronounce names correctly, and before you know it, you're a, you're a man of the world. No, Runa, Runa, and you spell Norway as well. <laughs> uh, N-O, nah, I'm lost. Um, uh, Runer Hauger. I think is is the correct pronunciation's name. I'll stand uh, stand stand corrected if, if that turns out to be wrong. Um, to be honest, never seen him play. Seen his brother play a few times. His brother's a cracking player. Um, not not long uh, ago went to AC Milan. I think he's on loan in Germany at the minute. Um, can't remember who who that. But brothers are brothers a fine fine player. Lovely Frankfurt. Thank you, Greg. Lovely balanced winger. Oh. Um, that kind of identical Norwegian um, footballer. Kind of you know technically quite proficient, but also. Um, in terms of athleticism, they generally <laughs> they, they they breed well in Norway. Uh, <laughs> generally, <laughs> generally the guys are, are, are you know much more athletic than your average player that play, plays in the Scottish league. So, I, th- I think um, you know it, 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 it looks like one another one that's raw based on you know based on the number of appearances he's made, uh, based on the number of goals he scored, the kind of clubs he's played at. Again, he's been playing much of his football in the the, the second tier. Uh, for Stjordal's Blink, uh, who, who I, I will tell you, I know absolutely nothing about Stjordal's Blink. I've never heard of them. Um, but but that, that's the club he's been playing at. They, you know, they, they finished a little bit lower down the league uh, than, than Ranheim that, that Melkerson was at. So, you know, a club kind of playing towards the, the, the bottom end of the second tier probably suggests that, you know, he's, he's, he's got some good minutes, some good experience under his belt. And uh, I, I think I trust in Hibs to, to, to sign the right players. We know that Bodo Glimp are producing... And an absolutely phenomenal amount of young, talented football players. So if we can pick up one or two gems for there, then we're laughing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Greg, have you got anything to add on this player that we virtually know nothing about, but Liam can pronounce his name and the team he was on loan at correctly? <laughs> um, no. Uh, although I have been to Norway, so uh, that must qualify me as, I don't know, an expert, I'd imagine. Um some people don't go to Norway and are experts, so um, I'll, I'll take that one. I've been there. I must be an expert. Um, seen a tweet earlier saying, shoot the Runar. Um, big fan of that. We can get that one going. Um, to be honest, it's for a sign we need. Um, I noticed that a lot of the coverage is saying that it's not a replacement for Boyle, which makes me excited. Um, we, can, I think we can big up Norwegian football all night, but we just need to wait and see till he's here um, and hopefully get some work permit he's that rocky. Yeah, well, I'm not going to give any more than that because I genuinely can't, but we'll have a wee bit of fun before we move on to departure. Um, Liam put a tweet out earlier saying that we need everybody and their dog signed for the club for the first team at the moment. If you could give me one dream signing, I've seen names like Jamie McGrath, seen names like Reagan Charles Cook thrown out there. Um, if we could bring one player in that's realistic... Um, who are you getting in the dodge for January window closes? Hauga. <laughs> <laughs> on top of him. On top of him. Uh, you know, I'll let right. Liam go first. He's the, uh, he's the, we'll let, we'll let Liam the go Scottish first. football hipster. I was, I was, I was all over Regan Charles Cook yeah. in the summer. And, 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 he was playing a lot deeper at that point and playing as a wing back. He's he's been pushed a bit forward further forward under Malky Mackay as a winger and he seems to be scoring goals. Um if a winger's what we need, then I would get him in. But I think my priority would still be a centre midfielder, an all action centre midfielder. Um not the Jamie McGrath type, if I'm being honest. I don't think he's quite what we need. I don't think he's all action enough. My my preference would have been for a He's not available just now, but an Ali McCann type player. That's that's the kind of guy we need. A box to box kind of guy who's gonna get on the ball and, and, and make things happen, but is is all round enough and versatile enough to kind of do all roles. I think we've got too many specialists and not enough all rounders. Yeah, I think that's a fair 
I will Ben Ken, so we can you listen. He probably doesn't. But we can you listen. If you get Alan McCann on the doors or words, words will be on. Right, Greg, any, any signings on your mind? No. Um, in fact, just Ben's going to see Griff because he's a goalie. Oh. Uh, rumour has, rumor has it he's going to the Rangers in the summer, isn't it? Um, but yeah, no, oh, all right. I'll, I'll let um, Liam give um, a heartfelt monologue. Uh, your your man who never really done much wrong or right for the club. Um, Melka Halberg officially had his contract terminated today. Liam, you look sad as soon as I mentioned it. Uh, how are you feeling? And was it the wrong choice? I think everyone is going to know my thoughts on this. I thought it was. I think it's a poor, poor football decision, poor business decision by the club. To be honest, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to slate any any one individual. But for me, he's a player who should have been given more of an opportunity than he was, and he, he hasn't been given that opportunity. He goes. It looks as though he's going to St Johnston, so he goes with our best wishes. But um, we saw flashes of it. I mean, the games that stand out for me was the first season that you know went over Aberdeen. Thought he was absolutely. Incredible that day. The, the new one went against Motherwell uh, after Jack Ross just started the game. He was absolutely brilliant in that semi final against London United, where um, he basically came in out of nowhere and ran the show in midfield and was the best player on the pitch. But, you know, these decisions are made. If we continue to sign players and put those round pegs in square holes, then maybe they won't work. But there's players who have underperformed for far, far longer than Halberg ever underperformed in a Hibs jersey. And, and I'm still at the club. So, poor, poor decision. You know, there's clearly some context we don't have, don't have the details of his contract, et cetera, et cetera. But he's a player that I think um, I think we should have kept hold of and we should have used him. Yeah, well, Greg, I'm more than happy to hear about your opinions on Halberg, but I'm more interested to know. <laughs> um, every, game by game, your uh, list of players you want to see leave the club seems to grow mm. exponentially. Mm. Um, who's who's your top three that we should be getting rid of and cull off before uh, end of the window? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, Jimmy Murphy's definitely like miles out in front of everyone else. <laughs> um, to be honest, it's difficult because obviously we've got I would say Matt Macy, but there's nobody really else. He obviously doesn't trust Dubrovsky. Um. Paul McGinn, if Harry Clark was fit. And um, to be honest, I'd play a horse trade right out as well. Um, I think Paul Hanlon's been very lucky not to make it in the top three, but I think we could play the left three centre half, so that's one of the reason he's still there. Yeah, I, I wasn't meaning to bring that up as a flounder to the club, but I do think it's fair to say that we have got quite a heavy squad at the moment, and I don't think we should be having quite as many players in as we do. So shifting it um, down, it's something that probably. I am, um, to, to be honest, Harry, I said it last night in the chat um, after the game, and I stand by it. The squad isn't good enough. Um, I think we've got a lot of bodies, but not a whole lot of quality. To be fair, I think we're very. Similar in the midfield, um, some players aren't good enough. You know, some we've not really had a proper look at yet. But I think that the, the squad really isn't that great. But that's my opinion. Just wanted to get that one out there after um, my comments in the chat last night. So. Yeah, mate. Um, you don't have to justify your comments in the chat uh, to all the people that aren't in the chat, but you crack on with that. Uh, Liam, any, any final thoughts on the squad, or do you think that we just kind of have to? Get at least another body in before the window closes. Bodies, bodies, Harry. I think it's bodies. I think I think the Hauga one, if looks as though it's a done deal, can get that over the line. I think get a centre midfielder in, potentially a winger in, as we've talked about. I would still like us to see if we can get a goalkeeper in as well between now and the end of the window. But I know not everyone shares that opinion. But I think there's a if there's an opportunity to sign better than what you've got between now and the thirty first of January, you sign the player who's better than what you've got. Well, I get slagged from my borderline silly comments, but clearly Liam is living in a football manager simulator. <laughs> <laughs> ah, mate, you get to, you get to, do you know, does time not slow down when you get to the end of a transfer window? Do you know, get to hit, take part in deadline day and, and time just moves really, really slow. Every minute it's like two hours and you get to sign all the players you want. Is that not how it works, huh? Yeah. <sighs> One thing that really opened everybody's eyes to how stressful transfers are is this, I, I assume you've seen Sunderland until I die. I believe it was the second season of that when they were trying to bring in players on deadline. They're trying to sign Will Gregg and um, 
Oh. They weren't the. I mean, Jack Ross said, "Don't go over." I think it was three mil. I think they went over four mil in the end. I mean, that 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 club has run horrifically. Um. So yeah, can I can I just chime in on my thoughts on Halberg, please, Harry? Ah, oh, yeah, mate, of course. Um, I I think Halberg's better than what we've got there. To be to be honest, I think he gives us something different. He can carry the ball forward. We've urgency, good range of passing. We can strike the ball fairly well, so I, I think he's probably better in there. I think he would add a different dynamic to to the midfield. But obviously, um, Sean Maloney has seen something that uh, that basically means that he um, he's not good enough for Hibs, which is which has gotten to be fair. But I just what it is, and I wish him all the best. Yeah, I, I, I feel bad because I've not really got the emotional connection that you two seem to have with Halberg. I, th- I think he was a good squad player. I don't really think that his ability was the, good enough to be the type of player we want starting week in, week out. I know it's fair to say that he's not really had that consistent run of the team because he was very good when he came back from injury last year. We went on that nice run um, just after we uh, stumped the place out. But I just think he was a bit inconsistent and he did seem to get injured quite often, which seems to be a problem with our best players at the moment. But Moving on, um, we're Halbergless, but we're facing Livingston Saturday, Easter Road, three o'clock kickoff. What type of team are we expecting, and what type of team would we like to see? Um, what type? What type of team? Um, hopefully, one that hits the fucking target. To be honest, for a start, Harry, <laughs> um, that, that 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 would be a good start. Um, yeah, uh, honestly, total. Totally. Fucking no, no, Josh Campbell, anybody. Um, I think you and Henderson in. I think L- Livy done quite well last night by the reports. So they're always a stuffy team. I think someone like you and Henderson who can maybe pick a pass a bit better than, than Josh Campbell. But to be honest, Harry, it's like life after my boil is kind of sucking at the moment. But yeah, I'm we'll wait and see. I, I would like to, see, I would probably like to see us go with two central strikers, maybe, maybe, maybe a 3 5 2 or. Or something similar, but I'd like to see us go with two central strikers, to be honest, because we don't seem to be putting enough pressure on, on the opposition goal. Yeah, well, Liam, in, in the last two games, obviously, uh, one of them were the cup games, squeezed in between a three game period, and um, we've seen quite a lot of changes throughout. Are you, do you think that's something that will be a key theme when Maloney's picking his team when we've got midweek games, or are you expecting it to be a relatively similar starting lineup as we saw the other night? He'll, ch- he'll change it again because I think he, he's got he's got some players coming back into contention, so there'll, there'll definitely be changes. Whether there's as many changes, I don't know. Um, Porches is obviously nailed on to come straight back into the starting lineup. Don't know about Hanlon's injury, Hanlon's, Hanlon's injury, but potentially that would see Bushiri move across uh, if Hanlon's not back or if he is back. Maybe McGinn drop out of the team. So I think we'll we'll go with a, probably three of those four players I've just mentioned at the back. I think Cadman and Doig will potentially keep their place, albeit I think Dimitri Mitchell will be pushing Doig for that left wing back slot if he's not pushing for a right wing slot. It's really weird thinking about a player and him being as an option at left wing back for, or right wing, but it's quite clear that's the two positions that he's going to play. So um, interesting uh, to, to see how that works. Um, I think Newell and Doyle Hayes will keep their place at a necessity. I, I think Josh Campbell will probably, probably, probably be dropped though. Given, given who we're playing against, you know, it's Livingston at home. Um, I expect us to have a lot of possession. I expect them to defend a lot for a lot of the game. Um, I'm probably defending quite a, a reserved kind of manner in terms of defending their own box. So we, we, we need guys who are willing to get on the ball and make things happen and take pot shots with distance. We're going to have to we're going to have to find a way to work the goalie. So maybe Henderson coming for Campbell. And it's been Miller up top. I think that's what we'll go with. Got there in the end. Hey, Greg, uh, take, take <laughs> me back. Um, don't, don't mean to trigger you, but last time we played Livingston away, obviously a horrible night, but ended up resulting in one of your favourite moments of last year, Jack Cross departing the club. Um, how how different do you expect this game to go compared to that game? Obviously, we're in a stinking run of form then. At, at the moment, we've only lost one in our last six, I think it is. Um and we're lucky the last team to beat us in the league for Celtic. Um, how how likely is it that Hibs can actually get revenge in this game? Or are you just concerned over the fact that we're not really generating anything going forward? Well, I like to be I like to be positive, Harry. You know that. So <laughs> although although we lost the game, um, 
Jack Ross did get sacked, so I'll take that as a silver lining. Um, to be honest, I, I think this game is totally different. Um, Livy were kind of fighting against relegation. I know they probably still are, but they've had a, a couple of decent results. We, we've had a couple of decent results as well. Um, just can't hit the target. So, to be honest, I think I, would, I just want us to boss the game. I want to see us in total control. Um, fluid passing, mix it up. You know, don't don't be predictable. Um, plenty plenty of balls in the box. I would say for for Dodge to, to attack. Um, and there's a bit to feed off. Uh, but I, like, I think we need to just mix it up and, and try and be try and be a wee bit different, um, a wee bit more dynamic, and don't be as predictable as we have been. Because I think that that's our biggest uh, that's our biggest downfall. To be fair, that even under Jack Ross, we're predictable, and I feel like we're getting back to that a wee bit. Um, passing the ball about sideways when no real purpose isn't for me so I want to see us playing the front foot attacking be adventurous be confident and, and just try and fucking hit the target please because do you know what the crowd will probably turn quite quickly if we don't I think if we maybe don't start the game um, that great I think the crowd will turn we kind of seen it on Twitter a uh, wee bit of an atmosphere building against Maloney already, which is strange, but look, Hibs fans expect a hundred goals a game. So we need to start quick, we need to start the front foot, shots on goal, and uh, yeah, because otherwise it could get could get a little little bit nervy. Yeah, well, um, talk to me about that because obviously Maloney's just in the door. It's like his third home game, um, maybe his second home game against Cove Rangers, and the players go off at half time to jeers from the crowd. Do you think that's a bit extreme? I know that Joe Neal's under a bit of scrutiny for kind of speaking out against it, but for me, I, I think it was a bit bizarre. I, I, like, I, I don't mind a good booth, the players have played crap, but I think it's a manager's fourth game. It's a bit extreme, isn't it? Maybe. I, I think the thing is, the, the, the thing that I always come up against here is. If you pay your money for your ticket, you're yeah, kind of, of entitled course. to react how you how you want. I know that's a really beige comment, but like I do think there is something about fans sometimes don't always maybe aren't always maybe as rational as they, they could and should be. That that comes with part and parcel of, of, of football, and that's why we all love it. It's difficult because I, my, my tendency is not to do that at games unless I'm really, really outraged like uh, Dundee United earlier on this season at halftime. I'm pretty sure that was one of those who were booing. But I feel like the players deserved it. Um, I think the thing that we underestimate as fans is the impact that that can have on on, on players' confidence and, and, and how they how they play ultimately in, in the game. So my, my tendency is always to prefer to support the players while they can. Having said that, yeah, yeah. It's difficult. I'm trying. I'm trying to find the right balance and argument for for what's right and what's wrong. I mean, the, the, the honest answer isn't there isn't a right or wrong answer. I respect those who choose to do. Who I don't respect are people who just choose to bash the team no no matter what. And there's a few of them out there. Like regardless of whether things are going good or bad, they they still find every angle possible to fucking try and stick a knife in the club. It's embarrassing. See people who do that. It's embarrassing. They're going supporting our team. It's quite hard. Aye, go and, go and support Hearts and go and wind their fans up. And go and chant, sell it, get battered everywhere they go at uh, home games. Absolutely. After being held yeah, back by absolutely nobody. <laughs> <laughs> she, oh. she just done that, though. I think that, you know, there is a, there is a difference between expressing your opinion. Um, I do it often enough, but I think assuming you're just booing for the sake of booing or you're getting on the team's back, just for the sake of it, they'll just give it up. Um, there really is no need for it. I think Johnny O'Boy deserves a criticism, but fair play to the boy for coming out and, and biting back. You know, I'd rather he done that than just shied away and said nothing. So. And one, one more thing I want to talk about, and then we can go on to our predictions for the game. Um, personally, I, I don't well, I, I don't think it's a mystery to anybody. The, the home form at Easter Road hasn't been good enough um, for many, many years now. It was all right under Lennon. But apart from that, we've always kind of struggled at Easter Road. Um, do you think that the fans have got any part to play in that? Because obviously, even during the pandemic, when there wasn't fans there, we were much better away from home than at home. Is there anything we can pin that down to, or is it just coincidence that we tend to not perform at Easter Road? I think, I, 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 I would probably say the Celtic Rangers have probably got the biggest travel and support in the league, haven't they? 
real, realistically, I, I think we tend to take bigger numbers than than, than Hearts to most places, despite despite the the seat counters telling us different. Um, I, I think we're, we're we are typically a very well supported club away from home. Um, at home, um, I don't think we're. I don't, I, 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 at home, I feel like certainly recent times, the atmosphere has been pretty flat. When I say recent times, I mean really this season, being back at, being back at Easter Road um, for, for one reason or another. I know obviously the, since 1875 guys have kind of stopped and you know, some, some new kids on the block who are, who are trying, but you know the atmosphere for me has is, is kind of been dwindling for, for probably a period of three or four seasons now, taking out the COVID season. So I don't think at the moment Easter Road is the best environment to play your football at home. Is what I'm trying to say in a really long-winded way. I think we could be making it a better place to play. You know, I'm not going to use the cliche about fortresses because it's fucking nonsense and lions dens because there's not going to be any lions there, is there? So <laughs> I, I think I think for me, we do we do need to look at it. something that the club I think will prioritise. We need to make it a better place to play play our football, but away from home. We're well supported, so away from them, there's not really any excuses. See, see, just for me on that, I, 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 I fucking bored the lugs of folk tonight. I feel like I've been a wee bit long winded tonight. However, I think that see, see when when our new manager comes in, you know, I guess the anticipation is that people will come back to the game if you know the style of football's played a certain way or or whatever. But these people are just lying to themselves because there's a good chance that they won't go to the game no matter how good Hibs are played or. You know, for me, it, I took a wee bit of slagging in the barbers last night because, it, and it's true, Hibs at home are such a shite support because ultimately, uh, the, look, the game last Thursday was on telly high, but it's a tenner, you know. Folk have been deprived of going to Easter Road for long enough. Why don't just go along, it's a tenner or a fiver or whatever. Just go along and, and just go to the game. Like, we had to shut two stands last Thursday. That is so embarrassing. Like, just go and support the team. You've probably ploughed money and w- watching the games on pay per view last season away for home and at home or whatever. Just go, just go to the road and support the team. Like, uh, it doesn't infuriate me because, like, uh, me and my granddad go every week. We've seen some shit, but we still go. Like, you just still go because that's what you do. I've never, I've never gone to and thought, Maybe just patch this next week or whatever. You know, you just go, go and support fucking Hibs, man. Like, folk are so fickle and folk are so easy to chirp in, but I've never actually go to the games. Like, and that sounds like such a childish thing to say, but it just annoys me there because Hibs could, Hibs, Easter Road could be such a good place to play football, but it just seems like folk aren't asking. What would, you do, what would you do to improve it? What, like, genuinely, from your perspectives, what would you do to improve that to East the road? Sorry, I know it's a massive tangent, Harry. See, see no, brother, no, no, I, I, think, no, I, I think it's a, I think it's a mindset thing. I don't think you can change it. I've changed the ticket prices from whatever to, to a ten or a five. I think it's fifteen quid if you're never seen to get like Hibs have done that. Folk, folk call out for that because that's the easy thing to say. That's the easy way out. Hibs done it and folk still didn't go. Regardless on the telly, who cares? I just I think it's a mindset thing. I think Hibs and folk are, are too easily done with Hibs and folk are too easily put off by going to Easter Road. So nah, that's my opinion. And if it's not a mindset thing, then I, don't, I really don't know what it is. I, I think, uh, I don't want to throw people under the bus, but I think there's a large majority of the Hibs fans that are incredibly fickle. I think if Hibs went on a season where we went to win, went on to fluke and win the league, I think by Christmas time, if we were top of the league, we would sell out the rest of the season. I think the next season, if we were sitting seventh in the league, I think the attendances would drop back to what they are now. Um, Hibs fans seem to be very um, like weather dependent in terms of the form. If we're playing, if it's sunny days and we're playing well, people will come along. If it's cold winters and we're crap, who cares? Um, I, I think that's backed up by figures. I, as I say, I completely appreciate people not being able to make games. We're not slagging people off for one-off misses. I know it's sounds hypocritical because I'm living down in London, but you know, like I, I miss family, and after that, I miss Hibs. That's that's literally it. Like it kills me not going to games. I don't understand when it's on your doorstep how you can't just walk along and get a bus along to a game. It's, I'm completely with Greg. That it just baffles me. I might, I might like different people take football in different ways, but for me, it's, it's confusing. I just don't get it. It's more than just a football, though. Like it generally is more than just a football. 
Um, it's, you know, it's inspired the least at the end of the week. It's a social event. You know, you see family that you maybe don't see all the time. You see friends you maybe don't see all the time. And you have that chat. And you know, it gives you something to talk about. I just think that, I honestly don't know what I, what else Hibs can do. To be fair, I think. Mate, can you even have a podcast on it talking about it that much? <laughs> uh, no, we could. Like, we could genuinely talk about. It. I, 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 I mean, you see the thing for the thing for me is, I think we're always in danger of kind of thinking that because that's our perspective. Everybody thinks like us. Like yeah, I naively thought that at the Livingston game, which was the first game of full attendance since the end of August, that there'd be twenty thousand people inside East Row because everybody would have missed the football as much as I did. And they didn't because only 15,000 or whatever showed up for that okay. game. And I was, I had that feeling when I was sitting in the stand of disappointment because there wasn't people who felt as like they'd missed it as much as I had. Because I hadn't been a Saturday three o'clock game in so long and I'd missed it so much. And I didn't, and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't feel um, like a momentous occasion whatsoever. But I do, there, there, is, a, there is a part of me that like, I know the club are doing all they can to try and attract people back and try and, you know, different initiatives to get folk in through the gates. Um, but I wonder if, to be honest, just where we're at just now as a club, it's just actually, this is just us kind of levelling off after the success in 2016. You know, good few years of good football. Actually, this is just where we're at in terms of the number of supporters that we really have who, who want to go to games on a weekly on a weekly basis um, I don't know if we can really bring more people through the door just because the style of football changes I, I just don't think the style of football is that big a factor I also don't think knocking four quid off the price of a ticket is that big a factor yeah it'll, it'll get some people back of course it will because it'll be the difference between some people who afford it or not but it's not, it's not going to revolutionise the, the attendance as it used to the road because you knock four quid off the price of a thing wait, or because you serve better pies in the kiosks do you know what I mean? There's just so many the flimsy reasons that people who don't go to games throw up for not throwing, for, for going to games. And there we are with a derby on Tuesday night on the 1st of February, which really in all respects, given this, the schedule and the fixture, shouldn't sell out and the game's been sold out for, for days now. But how many folk will be like, oh, no, nah, I'll just, just stay in the night, I'll just watch in the house. We'll make a decision on the day where, for mm-hmm. us, like, like, I'm looking forward to Saturday, Saturday, 3 o'clock at Easter Woods class, but my attention's already on the derby. You know, I'm already thinking about it. I'm already having chats with Hearts fans at work and that about it. So my attention's probably more so on the derby. But again, it goes back to the whole, well, I'm thinking about that. Why isn't anyone else? Or why, why aren't there people thinking about that? But I guess there's different ways of looking at it. But people have different priorities. You know, it's I just... Think it's one, one thing, if you don't mind me wrapping up on this, because I'm sure we've offended several people already, um, I think that we are massive believers by the way we realise that we're not in the storylines of football. I think when you go week in and week out, you kind of take every single chapter of the story. And when you get the monumentous occasions like the Derby, you know, it's not just Hibs v Hearts, it's their full season versus our full season so far. And then after that win, it's like, oh, we've got the momentum, we can catch them now. And then if it's a cup game that's huge, then, you know, it's that step closer to glory. Um I might be speaking for you and you might think, Harry, that's an absolute bunch of nonsense. But I think that the whole thing with football is it's not one Saturday, it's every Saturday. You know, it just builds towards something that's bigger than we can even explain. Um, but yeah, interested. If you're still listening to us ramble on at this point, please send us a <laughs> comment on Twitter and let us know what your opinions are. Are we just deluded to think that everybody should love football as much as we do? Or is there just a perspective that we're missing? Because we would genuinely love to know. But guys... One final thing before we wrap up. Greg, Saturday, three o'clock, Hibs will have a, by the time it's five o'clock, are you going to be a happy man or are you going to be like, oh, piss off, Hibs? Well, a wee bit of both, to be fair, even if we do them. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think I'll be a happy man, to be fair. I think that we're still going through the transition, but we are going to come good, I think. So I'll, I'll go I'll go three one Hibs. And Liam... You're going to leave the stadium, you're going to hit the green thing above the, what do you call it, walkway as you're walking out. Are you going to be hitting it with frustration? Damn it, we've got hearts in two days, I'm shite myself. Are you going to be hitting it like, come on, bring it I think I am, actually. I think, I think, I think we're going to do the business of Saturday. I think we're going to look good on Saturday as well. I think we're going to get our, we're going to peak just in time for the end of Derby on Tuesday. I think we're going to win 3-0. Um, I think we're going to um, do a job on Livingston. I think we'll score early and we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll We'll force them to come out and we'll get another couple of goals later on in the game. I think Chris Miller's going to get his first goal. I think Kevin Nisbet's going to score as well. Uh, I think um, 
I think I think our, our front court are Ryan Porteous. I think uh, just him being back in the team, I think is massive for us. Don't think we can understate the the difference he makes with how he distributes the ball out from defence. So I think uh, I think he'll he'll help us in the moment, you know. Well, I love the positive intent to end it all. And I'll join in. I think that we'll be 4-0 up, but I think that we'll fall asleep and they'll score a wonder goal, similar to what happened when we played Dundee United. We now sit with 4-1. So we've got 4-1, 3-0 and 3-1. That's probably the most positive predictions we've had all season. But yeah, guys, it's been a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you, Harry. Cheers.